this is uh, Frank Henschker from the Siegel Center in Midtown Manhattan. I think it's our talk 148. Uh, it's uh, 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 again a little bit cold, grayish day here in uh, New York City and uh, some church bells are ringing close by. It says it's noon. It means Siegel talk time. And thank you for joining again. We yesterday had uh, the great Emily Mann with us. It was just stunning to hear about 30 years of her leadership at the uh, MacArthur Theater in Princeton and Carol Martin um, and joined us. So that was a, a great update. Uh, it goes by. It uh, says it's noon. It means Siegel talk time. And thank you for Bridget joining. Linehan, uh, I hear, uh, uh, I hear uh, uh, feedback. Is that, do you all hear that? 30 years of her leadership at the uh, MacArthur Theater in Princeton and Carol Martin um, and joined us. So that um, sorry, that was me. I think I'm sorry. Okay, okay, yeah. So um, I'm so um, sorry. I so, uh, and um, and uh, we had uh, Fergus Linehan from the Edinburgh Festival giving us an update. What are they planning on Wednesday? It was uh, quite um, uh, a, a quite a, a, a challenge for them. They open on August, but they don't know how they will open. Not if at all. They created new outdoor structures. And um, and um, so he shared his his vision, you know, how we all um, should be going forward. We had David Goddard, who runs around the Great Riverdale, uh, Riverside Studios in London. Uh, we had uh, uh, Kari Perloff with us, and um, and today we uh, stay true to our mission. The mission of the Seagull Center always has been to bridge academia and professional theater and the performing arts, but also. American theater and international global theater. And today we have with us two Berliners and like all true Berliners, they are not uh, uh, from Berlin. They uh, come from uh, all around the world, but everybody who is in Berlin is a Berliner. We all hope there are never any foreigners. Once you live there, that's who you are. And we have uh, Joanna Warsaw with us. And uh, so uh, Joanna, thank you for, uh, for joining us. And uh, how are you and where are you? Well, thank you, Frank, for having us. Abul is joining in a few minutes, jumping from another call. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, not like in New York. This is a very nice day, plus 25 in Berlin and very sunny after Friday afternoon. Good, good, good. I heard after cold days, now the summer you know, ha has come. Um, Joanna and Ulvul, who will join us shortly, created something outstanding, something uh, stunning and beautiful. It was called um, Die Balkone. Uh, life, Art, Pandemic, and Proximity. Uh, she uh, initiated that festival together with Uvul, and, and we're going to hear um, all uh, about it. Let me tell you all a little bit about uh, Joanna, and, um, and she is uh, someone who we um, admire, whose work is important and significant. Uh, and, uh, she's the program director of the Curator Lab at the University of Arts uh, in Stockholm, the Konstrak University and an independent curator and editor. And uh, she is investigating the social and the political uh, in the arts and um, in the white cubes, as she says, inside and outside of it. She created together with Uvul Dormujulu, who will come with us today at the Balkon in Berlin. She's involved in many biennales, whether it's in Kosovo, whether it's in Riga in Venice, uh, in Berlin, and uh, many, many works you can all um, look up. So she's a very experienced European curator and um, comes brings for her Polish Eastern European sensitivity upbringing also with her. So she has a very interesting view on what art and politics, politics or the political um, is um, all about. And, um, and of course, she also writes and curates and puts uh, things together in museums around the world, also Warsaw, of course. And also she has been at the Siegel Center and, um, and she was uh, famous for, for, for also one performance where a, a soccer player all by himself recreated a, form, a famous uh, uh, a game. Can you tell us one second uh, about that, Price? Yeah, beautiful performance of Massimo Furlan who, uh, who recreated many games actually, always repeating a choreography of a main player. So actually, uh, last time I worked with him was East Germany, West Germany match, a famous match from 72 when East Germany um, 
despite uh, like uh, um, you know the expectations won one zero with Jurgen Speinwasser and he was recreating Jurgen Speinwasser. Yeah, and what you do, the stadium is empty or the normal spectators, no game, and just the one player. He's yeah. alone on the whole stadium. Basically, it's a childhood dream coming true. You know, how to become a f famous foosball, footballer that he didn't become. And then he became as an artist, this famous footballer, running alone on the pitch. And you sit um, in the stadium and you hear uh, a comment, a comment, either original comment, depending on the match either original uh, commenta commentary uh, from this match or as it was in East German, West German uh, case, either East German commentary or West German commentary, but parallel reality. Incredible, incredible um, 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 thing. And um, we have now with us Uvul. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I know you had to jump from another call. And uh, so yes. thank you for thank taking- Thank you for your patience. Thank you for- Not at all. Thank you for taking the time. Both of you are such, uh, such great workers, hard workers um, in the world of the arts, theater uh, and performance. And um, she's a, uh, Uvul is a, Uvul Dormuzuglu uh, is a mentor and a program leader in the graduate school in university and the arts in Berlin. Yes. So we are colleagues um, in a way, and also a visiting professor for the Hochschule der Bildenden Künste HDK in Braunschweig, the fine arts uh, in Braunschweig. She was a curator for the famous uh, Steirische Herbst Festival in Graz. And um, in Sofia, uh, she worked uh, in festivals, the Istanbul Biennale, and she was part um, of the documenta, the famous documenta, also 13. And together with uh, Joanna, she initiated that thing, the Die Balkone, the Balconies, uh, Live Art Pandemic and Proximity um, on Windows and Balconies of the Berlin Sprenzlauer Berg neighborhood, where she lives, where both of them live, but also so many, many artists. And we're going to hear all uh, uh, about it. She also writes like Joanna, so Kunst and Fries and many, many other things. Um, thank you. Where are you? Are you uh, in Venice, uh, in Castle Documenta? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I am. Um, I'm, I'm in Lisbon at the moment. <laughs> oh, you are. In Incredible in Lisbon and Portugal. So, I mean, it's one of the very rare times that I got out of Prince Lavabag. So it uh, it kind of find our time of our conversation. So yeah, it's not so common that I'm uh -huh. out of Prince Lavabag, but here I am. Today I'm in Lisbon. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> let's start right away. Um, we we uh, all uh, live in the time uh, still of uh, Corona, the pandemic uh, in. Uh, where uh, we are confined uh, to our homes, where we have been confined to our homes for a very long time. Uh, here, especially in New York, very little happened. Uh, we artists very strongly felt not to put their lives at risk, the life, life of spectators just for a performance, a show, um, online engagements, uh, of course, where they are outside, some great outside events at the parks or um, the Kaufman Center, musicians played inside a storefront, they had a fantastic installation or so have of speakers outside and all day long at three different times, people come to see um, really significant, important musicians who play um, for them live, but behind a, a glass uh, and, and many, many, many other things, many great, walks and things, but um, what you guys created um, is something different. So um, um, tell us a little bit um, about it. What were the thoughts behind and how did it work? Maybe uh, Joanna, can you start? Uh, yes, of course. Well, you know, I guess we all remember the beginning of the pandemic and the shock of the first lockdown. And in a way, the whole project came also from, from this kind of shock. Uh, that business as usual is stopping and what does it mean and both of us met at the park which is in our district Prenzlauerberg East Berlin former East Berlin and you know as it is uh, everyone was talking about it so we of course also were discussing the situation or what was uh, where are we at and what is and actually we also discussed the fact that all museums and theaters immediately wanted to continue digital life in the digital sphere you know they a little bit pretended okay, now we are just switching to the digital. And we felt maybe that's not the best thing to do at the moment, that maybe despite the hard lockdown, actually maybe it's a moment to test how can art be also a form of resilience in the analog sense. So from this conversation- so You both met in the park with masks on, uh, 
Yes, in the, we wi in the winter or Uvil, what happened? It was it in the winter or when was that? <laughs> it was the early days, oh. uh, and it was mm -hmm. March. Uh, March last year. It was like it was like the March last year, and I think it was like uh, towards the last weeks. I think it was like the the. 26 or something. Yes, 26, 26 when we started our Seagull that, Talks, actually. Yes, yeah. 26. So actually, you know, and also in my situation, um, I, uh, because I'm also uh, working for uh, the art fair in Spain called ARCO. And then actually I was in Spain just before the, the you know, pandemic explosion happened in Madrid. And uh, I was also very touched by that as an experience to so basically I was very lucky, you know, that uh, because I also worked in one of the most collectively, you know, publicly crowded uh, places and um, and uh, nothing happened, but it was a really like a kind of, it was really pure luck. So I was very also shaken, I have to say, by that, uh, by the experience when I uh, came to Berlin from my side. And, uh, and indeed, like these conversation uh, I think was inspiring for for both of us. Uh, maybe I am like I'm a Mediterranean person, as someone coming from Turkey. So I also have a very different relationship with balconies and the way social lives like take place in balconies. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something really like kind of also very much part of my imagination. But of course, it all shifted, you know, with the, all these meanings shifted uh, with the pandemic, and especially those days when. We were conversing with Joanna. It was very much we were very much struck by the images of people communicating with each other over their balconies, giving concerts to each other over balconies, or you know, practicing actually their art like from their balconies, in order to. So there was this really beautiful moment of sh really sharing that was happening in the early times of the pandemic that really also inspired us to uh, use that space of maybe make a proposal to our artist friends to use our balconies and to really give uh, ourselves a possibility of uh, taking a ground and expressing how we feel uh, about our situation. And then we can communicate nonetheless as we are, uh, mm. all, we are artists, art producers, thinkers, we can find ways like to communicate with each other uh, in such a time when we, felt limited and like cornered. So that means uh, to imagine it um, um, for our New Yorker audience, like in Orchard Street, um, there are, you know, buildings four or five uh, stories high. Um, and there are most of them do have balconies. They are not too far from each other. You could perhaps even still shout right across the street yeah. and hear someone. So you were observing each other, uh, like in Hitchcock's rear window, and you saw people making art. So, um, uh, and, um, this has happened very fast then, John. I don't know, March was a very beginning. It was clear to both of you, um, this will take a long time to get back to um, what is supposed to be the normal. And you um, felt the absence of your normal work. And you said, let's do that right away. So it happened in March, April, right away, you did that or? We well, took action very clearly, like just to, just to close, to, to bridge to Joanna. I mean, from the moment of this, this part conversation to like when we wrote the text, it was in 10 days. And when we took the action, it was basically in the next 10 days. So everything took more or less like the time of like 18 to 20 days. So, so when did it happen in April? It happened, yeah. uh, it happened Easter on the Easter weekend in April, 12th and 13th of April last year. But then also it happened this year again on the 1st of May. So tell us a little bit, um, um, what was the scope? Uh, how many people were involved? Maybe you have some images to share. What, how did it look like? Well, you know, first of all, also why we did it, to come back yeah. to the previous question, uh, it also um, was a feeling of, you know, being a Berliner, being in Berlin in the time of pandemic and realizing that actually what is special about Berlin and also about New York to a degree is that you have so many artists per square meters that they come from so many different backgrounds. You know, there is, it's um, somehow the locality of Berlin that we were all stuck there and the, na the global nature of, of people living here came together in this moment. And uh, the idea to, to send each other signals through art. And, and also the idea that 
you know, of course, the most important professions, uh, and this is what is called in Germany, system relevant, system relevant professions, were not the artistic professions, but our question was, what could we do also as curators and artists? So it came out of the need, in a way, to react to the situation. And then, as Ovul said, we formulated this letter. It was also like a test. We formulated a letter to our neighbors, both to the artists we knew and also those we didn't know. And it was a little bit like a snowball effect, you know, that people kind of felt, uh, yeah, they felt intrigued and they felt taken by this proposal. So they reacted. It was, you know. A letter, I mean, you it, printed something out and distributed it in mailboxes? We wrote a text together. We wrote a text together and uh, we used emails, of course. Yeah. yeah. Still some, some, some digital sphere was used in the preparation of this project. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it was very magical, this, this process that Duna Zoyana is describing. It was very magical for us. It really was, you know, almost there are certain things on the world that, you know, when you put this idea on, it really takes you in front of it and it pushes you to realize itself. So we really felt also through this way with the beautiful reactions that we received from, uh, from our community uh, to realize it. And uh, we started with a circle of uh, 12 friends, so to say, and in the end, we became around like 50 and the community was growing even until the last day, you know, because everybody wanted to join and it was also the possibility, of course, like to do it from home, to use the domestic space also as a studio space sometimes and like to use complete DIY uh, tendencies in order to make, you know, in order to send out a smoke signal. Uh, to mm -hmm. the neighborhood and to the world and to show that, you know, we exist, we are here, uh, we communicate and we take our space. Mm -hmm. Almost in that sense of our show to signal through the flames, um, yeah. um, you know, um, um, and that we are there, that we exist and uh, we do care about each other or en Bogart exactly. said, it's kind of a knock knock at the door, how are you? Um, was it some streets, you say these are four streets, a square, or everybody in that kind of, a Prenzlauer Berg would be something like Soho uh, or, or, or Chelsea in New York. It's like a larger neighborhood. So how did it work? Do you say these are the streets where we live in and, uh, or was it uh, distributed around the neighborhood? Um, well, you know, it started from Prenzlauer Berg because this is where we live. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, yes, you see that, uh, in a way, uh, the neighborhood became a blurred border. It's, we are not, you know, there were some people on the edges, but uh, it's a big neighborhood. And uh, the best is like in Münster to visit it with the bike. So it, it was not on two free streets, but still it was a neighborhood project and the project that also revived the idea of what it is to live next to each other. Yeah, and be able to do the knock knock, as you said. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, and also I think um, German, as I am German, our uh, um, a life at home, the private space, you know, is something very, um, in a way, hold almost sacred. If you get invited to a family, it means something, you know, it's not <laughs> as open as it should be, perhaps, as in our, you know, European neighbors and our friends. And um, as uh, um, we heard, you know, that, that the use of public space and balconies is different. So it's a great... Uh, perhaps recalibration of, of a city life. And um, how, how about the audiences? How did that work? And um, did people know about it? They discovered it while it happened? Was it a surprise, kind of a guerrilla art? Uh, or how, did, how, how did people uh, join in? Well, it, it also, I mean, it, a little bit of all of what you mentioned, but of course it also transformed, you know, towards the second edition. Um, mm -hmm. But in the in the first edition, uh, it was a uh, it was very slight gestures, sometimes big, sometimes slight gestures. Sometimes, like the whole buildings were used. You know, neighbors mm -hmm. also were invited, and um, and sometimes um, uh, uh, sometimes it was just like a kind of a very small, you know, like a kind of an arrow or a sign, like that was referring to a particular situation, but. In terms of our communication with the public, we used uh, social media because at that point also uh, we just distributed everything through, uh, through Facebook, basically. Uh, and then we made the link and then we also like created a very different map of our neighborhood that is also very important, I think, to, to share here because it's a really different cartographic uh, exercise, uh, psychocardiographic exercise uh, as well, because we, uh, because we wanted to 
protect the privacy of our uh, artist participants, we actually put um, approximate, very approximate points on the maps, but not their addresses. So it wasn't like this kind of pinpointed GP that can be mm -hmm. GPRS kind of addresses that we gave uh, to the to our public, which is generally different than other public space projects. So we really kind of uh, differ differ over there, and it. It also like uh, invited our audience to play the game to our public to play the game with us in terms of which balconies mm -hmm. around could be those balconies because so sometimes the the gestures is were big but sometimes the gestures were subtle so uh, and then it was then in a whole different way of relating. Uh, to the neighborhood also to make us realize basically when we are going like head forward to a certain address we also lose actually the relation with the surrounding. So this was also an invitation back to, um, uh, to uh, looking us, around to ourselves in a kind of a different, uh, in a kind of a different way. And we saw like really people sharing information on each other with themselves, like which address is where, which artists maybe is like maybe doing so uh, or what, and like informing each other or like trying to find all together uh, a certain mm -hmm. balcony and making guesses. So these were very beautiful conversations for us. Uh, so um, to me to understand, it's not that you had to be a neighbor across the street. It happened also live. You could go on the Facebook sites and see what uh, the 12 or 20 or at the end 50 artists were doing. Or was it, did people walk around the streets in their masks to look, to look up, Jonah? Maybe you tell us a little bit, how was that? How did it happen? Yeah, well, uh, we really were analog in the project. It was a project that was also like a new dimension of the public, you know, creating public sphere through art. However, of course, there is a sec first audience, which is there on the streets. And in, that was a hard lockdown. So really maximum two people together could yeah. walk. But it was absolutely, you know, to, so to be, to, it was doable. Of course, you are free to go for a walk. Mm, but obviously, as with many projects, there is secondary audience, a third audience. So later on, you could, and you can still see it on our website, uh, and you can experience those projects. And actually, from this very local neighbor, um, neighborhood initiative, this project, uh, you know, got covered by Reuters and another press agencies, and got Agence, it, Pres, Agence France, I think also Agence France Press, Pres, yeah. but also others, others, and it got its editions in many, many other countries. In a way, it uh, it grew uh, and inspired other uh, neighborhood projects, uh, who then wrote to us and made their own. Uh, and that that was also a true. It's a true bottom up project. It's not that we now claim mm. we have curated somewhere else. It kind of got contaminated. What are the other cities? Where did it happen? In what other places? Um, it happened in in Paris. A version of mm. it was realized in Paris through our really good colleagues, and then another version was realized in uh, in actually Chile, starting from Santiago to Chile, in the whole Chile. And another uh, another version was in uh, was in Delhi, like it was a more like a smaller artist project, and the one actually in our city in Kreuzberg it was mm -hmm. an artist group also who took it the idea over and call it, this is an intervention. Mm -hmm. and, and then there was also another uh, version in uh, the close by version in Sweden uh, and then also in Taipei. So it was really like, there were a lot of uh, <laughs> communications over like transnationally over balconies and even over oceans. Incredible, right. almost like instructional art. You had uh, some instructions to uh, be in your neighborhood create something in your balconies, share it, you know, with the neighbors and give freedom to artists to, uh, you know, uh, explore whatever they would like to do. I would yeah. like to ask both of you a question. Um, so many artists we talked to, also curators said, um, when the lockdown started, it, life came to a halt. It was a shock to the system, the kind of a car that, you know, is breaks and flips and you're still in the air, you don't know where you land. And, um, and people say it was a time we took out, we reflected, we went to our inner selves and communicated and understood, you know, what we did uh, was too fast, too much, and we lost some connections. You guys very fast created something. And um, 
do you, do you both feel this was a continuation of your practice because you wanted to continue or was it something new where you felt uh, we we have to engage now in a different way and not being in in Venice and Sofia and in uh, Poland and uh, all around the world in Portugal and Spain we do something in our neighborhood so uh, tell me a little bit how, what that moment meant to you and how it is really connected to the concept and vision of the project well yeah, you yeah. know as we know in the moments of crisis the moments of crisis are good moments to rethink certain things yeah. right they are shaky moments in which you see the power dynamics which you see the, your routines so i guess it was more also of a gut feeling that for us uh, who are so-called independent curators we are not a big institution that now will think what to do we can react quite fast that was also, it was intuitive in a way, but then later we thought about it, that it was also this condition of in, in, uh, being independent, in fact, interdependent. How can we now express the fact that we are interdependent through art? And also, can art be also an expression of necessity of this moment and maybe some kind of recovery? Because we were craving for sense, all of us, right? We were craving to understand the moment in which we are. And definitely art is a medium which can try and help us to sublime this moment, to show signals, you know, to, um, to augment it, to, to turn it, to recontextualize it. And so, you know, it was a gut feeling, but of course, uh, somehow something was telling us, yeah, we need to, we need to do it right now. Um, yes, um, I mean, we both, as Joanna said, definitely, like it was that intuitive, that was, that was the push. Uh, that really like um, made us also organize ourselves in a very fast way in order to respond rather than to retreat. Because I think we both believe that the responses that you give to the moments of crisis very much then defines, you know, how you relate with it also, uh, also afterwards. And, uh, and then we refuse to take a step back. In a way, we wanted to move forward and we wanted to take the challenge and see what is uh, what is there for us, which is, I think, also, yes, I mean, also in the project space, but I think also personally, it was very, very uh, formative gesture, you know, in terms of like changing the relationship with the crisis. And indeed, uh, you know, uh, uh, indeed, art has always a very particular, you know, responsibility in relation with the moments of crisis, in witnessing uh, and in transforming in uh, the moments of crisis. But at this, uh, in this part, it was more like kind of stop and see. And at the same time, it was also, yes, it is soon going to be over. So we are going to go back to our normal lives as uh, you know, um, when once this is over. So most of us also like kind of, I think felt that by the time one year is over, or by the time even like the springtime was over, this will be over. But it, you know, it's still not over, and we are still inside it, and we are still like, actually like uh, growing with it, also human-wise, you know, and also in relationship uh, to our surroundings. So, um, uh, so curatorially, I think both of our practices really carry that strong relationship with the formations of of public spheres. Uh, and like also in, in to believing in that kind of gesture creation in order to intervene into the collective memory of public space, where the action also takes place and uh, where the kinds of actions, especially like art takes can also reframe, you know, that public space. And this is, uh, uh, this is also like kind of the most visible, uh, I guess, like in arts and performance history in very various critical moments. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, um, and then also like kind of one, one maybe important thing to, to add that uh, we also believe that there is actually a particular being stuck, you know, in the kinds of formats that we are using for that art world, may it be the fair, may it be the biennial, may it be, you know, uh, uh, may it be like kind of the museum exhibition structure. So we felt actually both that there is something that needs to be like kind of addressed and changed, but nobody really kind of knew and wanted to continue despite, you know, there were all these different reactions and responses. 
uh, that were uh, that were growing. So I think also in that sense, you know, uh, pandemic also uh, uh, pushed us like the question, okay, you know, what about the new formats uh, that need to respond? So because clearly we cannot go on doing the same thing. The world is asking us to do another thing. And so we really need to also take an action in order for like uh, doing that so that we can also go along, you know, in a way with the creative flow and let the way open, lead the way open towards other things also socially. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, this is also still a, like a kind of a major question uh, that remains because we also saw actually our arts, professional arts colleagues started to respond differently in the second edition than the first edition. When did the so second us, edition like the take place? Edition uh, was it edition, a year, a year, just one second. Uh, each other. The second edition was one year later. Right. Yes. And, it was and what just were the like numbers? How ago. many people uh, participated? And um, what was the difference to the first one? Maybe, Joanna, yeah. you can tell a bit. Yeah, Joanna, maybe you start, I continue. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the second edition was also uh, going against uh, how biennials are normally reinventing themselves anew, right? Or exhibitions or premieres or like why do we need to like start from scratch while we already have this wonderful neighborhood and so many artists here so actually we address the invitation to all the artists again with the same artists obviously naturally as it is in life some moved out some others moved in somebody was already traveling but uh, the condition the pandemic condition the idea of being a neighbor um, but also uh, looking closer where we actually live what is former East Berlin, what has become with this gentrified place, which is Prince Lauerberg. What is the East German history of this place? Uh, you know, those questions uh, were not there in the first edition and they naturally throughout this first year uh, arose. So the second edition was, uh, yeah, is even more, even more participant, almost the same, 80% the same, plus some new ones. Maybe and, show us some images so we can get a, get yeah, a, actually, get an idea um, yes, if you have something. Course. And um, Please, so I'm we sharing right now. Yeah. Can you? Sorry, it has to open. Mm, you see the massive that backdrop of my computer. Or <laughs> we are working crazily at the moment, so it's uh -huh. like <laughs> all around. Um, right. So, for example, uh, this is. Um, this is a piece that, sorry, uh, uh, uh. you can see it or I am trying no. to. We, just, we are just seeing the list, John, at the moment. Still, uh, uh, you trace the images, but we don't see the images. Okay, let me, and now? It's, I guess it's coming. It's, uh, it's uploading, it's coming. yeah. Screen is paused, stop share. Okay, well, let, one more time, sorry. Okay, yeah. one more time. Uh -huh. So, so we get an idea of it, yeah? Look, mm -hmm. here. Yeah, maybe also Wait. in the meantime, I can I kind of introduce, I mean, in, introduce the fact that actually with the, of course, support of our community, with the generous support of our community and our public, we also decided to move into, you know, different researches that we are kind of connecting, you know, with the, with the public gesture and also with that public private relationship that we are uh, we are interested in so the second edition also not only involved you know the regular balcony and they, or kind of it became becoming regular now uh, like kind of balcony interventions but there also existed that kind of different public space researches about the monuments in our in our neighborhood mm -hmm. and, and also some of like the and then also domestic as artistic archive uh, so we also, because Prenzlauerberg is a kind of a well-known also neighborhood yeah. for the early after wall, uh, you know, very artistic neighborhood, very highly populated and is still highly populated, as yeah. Johanna says. Uh, so how do we trace actually uh, the domestic, uh, the artistic archive in the domestic space? And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that was also a particular inspiration, for example, came uh, from the uh, from the apartment that I live in, it's which used to be the apartment of uh, Rikvi Travanija, who is a nomadic, also long term New York uh, resident artist, and, uh, and he was there with his ex partner for a really considerable amount of time and produced really like important works in that period that you know. Uh, 
uh, that heightened his name and his artistic legacy, you know, in the contemporary art circles. Uh, uh, for example, like we had that kind of a special project in my house with his kind permission and uh, encouragement uh, to really like um, uh, give an excess of, uh, of the work that he had done uh, in the house, in the period of the house and to connect the house to his New York and Chiang Mai residences. Give us a, both of you a little bit of idea. What happened really on the balcony so we can get an idea or an image? Uh, what can you what, see what the, was the actual thing? Can you see the image now? It's like, it's there. Yeah. Eager. I think I can yeah. see mine. My screen works. So yeah, we see two, we see a house, yeah. a house facade, uh, balconies and two, two large train station like clocks. Exactly. So this is a, a it's a piece of David Rich, one of our neighbors, uh, which is called Untitled uh, Perfect Lovers uh, slash Untitled Our Times, because it's actually a tribute or a remake of a famous work uh, of Maria Gonzalez Torres from 1997 that shows two uh, clocks, which are, um, you know, going in synchronized, synchronized clocks. However, because they are not atomic clocks, at one point, one of them will go out of sync. And it was a, a project made um, at the moment when his partner was diagnosed with HIV. So another uh, pandemic period. So David brings back this work, shows those clocks only with the hour, um, uh, Zeichnen, our, mm -hmm. like, only our drawing, scene, hours, drawing. Mm -hmm. drawn, um, also to kind of maybe signal and reflect back at the flow of time that he, we have been experiencing in this last year, you know, in a way, these days being so similar and time flowing, but also, of course, putting this on one hand, two pandemics which cannot be compared, and yet they are both pandemics, they are both state of exceptions. So putting those two experiences together and um, it was one of the first and maybe one of the most powerful artworks he installed in his windows. Yeah. So it is also, I think we, we also see it as a very important, you know, like kind of a nod like here David, David makes in, you know, for us, like what did we learn from that, you know, last, last pandemic? And what did it remain that did, did we learn our lesson as, as humans? Did we learn to you know, care about each other? Did we really like uh, change a little bit uh, our attitude? So he, he really beautifully also connected, you know, uh, connected uh, these two periods, uh, which we would remember as I think also uh, as Douglas with Douglas Crimp's beautiful uh, expression of uh, morning, militant, militant morning. So yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, I think David's piece was also in this, mm -hmm. it was an act of militant mourning in this way. Yeah, yeah, and also away from photography, what Douglas wrote a lot about, you know, to, to pieces. Were this most closer to visual arts or do you also had bodies uh, uh, on, of, of people pre performing? Things? Various. What, what? It was we various, really. It was really depending on... Um, in all the different practices. And uh, we also have different artists closer to performing arts that reacted, responded differently in the, with all of their mm -hmm. actually artistic expertise. Yeah, uh, but just for me, I cannot see the photos because they are hidden by the uh, by your images. You know, maybe you have to do it full screen so we cannot see. Yeah, I don't know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having problems. Yeah. You guys talk and I try to fix this and yeah, show yeah, yeah. you. If we not, don't worry about it. We can yeah. always look it up and... Um... No, but you know, just to add this, because yeah. uh, about the genre of this exhibition, it's an exhibition, but because neighbor are, are coming, you know, from all disciplines. They're musicians, they're theater makers, they're writers, or they're visual artists. At the end, it was very interdisciplinary. So last yeah. year we had Rabia Mrue and Lina Madeleine, who actually invited all the neighbors and the whole building spoke for itself in a way, in a performative way. And in both editions, we had um, Susanne Zaxe and Mark Ziegel, who are queering the streets with the performances from their balconies. So we did absolutely had also the, you know, live performance, a lot of live performance, actually. Uh, maybe we can, yeah. Yeah, actually in the, in, the first, in the first work of Suzanne and Mark, actually like one of the figures that they mourned because they lost three friends, including Douglas, 
uh, and also uh, Tabea Blumenschein and like uh, Volker Schlondorf. Uh, they commemorated them all together and their relationship actually, you know, to an alternative like way of thinking life and how they contributed to that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then they mourned actually also, you know, in the, in the first edition uh, with their, um, uh, in a kind of a very beautiful phantom like founding experience. So the, the speech was recorded mm -hmm. and it was given to the street like every uh, every 20, 30 minutes, and then, uh, and sometimes in German and sometimes in English, like kind of uh, uh, alternately, like moving, uh, but there was no one to be seen in the balcony also, but only the images of Douglas Tabea and Volker Schlondorf that really created, especially in the first edition, I think when, the, of course, the streets were much more less populated, for example, the voice, echoed throughout the whole street. It was very poetic. Uh, and then of course, in the second edition, they again used up, you know, like made a second gesture very much similar to that, but this time with the images of, um, uh, uh, with the images of Bini Adamja, Paul Preciado, uh, uh, and uh, Vaginal Davis. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Vaginal, um, also an American artist based uh, based in uh, Berlin for a very long time now. Uh, so exactly, so this was like the piece, the, the uh, let's mal, uh, ask the mal. So they were actually referring to that, like when was the first time and when was the last time, but they were very much also breaking at the moment the, the code of a very gentrified uh, neighborhood. So they were also like asking uh, very, uh, very radical uh, questions, uh, such as, uh, even such as like when you had last time had sex in public space. So really like kind of pushing against also the norms that define our public space at the moment and like then the queering also um, uh, our experience in a very particular uh, way. And uh, then the audience were also like able to participate further this time by receiving actually like different instructions, instructions that you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, um, and that quite is in the form of questions to really also like think about when was their first time and when was their last time. Mm. Do we have some kind of statistics who say how many people kind of saw it, enjoyed it, recognized it, is there? Um, it's the beauty of public projects that you really actually never have the mm the kind of number, because the yeah. number is also very much, I think, very <clears throat> part of um, like com uh, liberalization of art, like art as an industry and like kind yeah. of counting people with numbers. But I think what pub one of the beauties of the public space is like that actually kind of, it's unidentifiable. Mm -hmm. uh, but we could certainly see that um, thanks to uh, really, a, really good press coverage uh, by some really important also writers, different newspapers, we received a different kind of public that we saw who mm. came also for the for the project when we yeah. were for sure, we 10, were touring 000. around the neighborhood. As you can yeah. imagine, we were touring around the neighborhood uh, yeah. with our bikes back and, yeah. back and forth. And for sure, tens of thousands of people as first viewers and then as you said, second and third viewing and we are now looking at it um, and so um, it is a, a stunning um, a reinterpretation. And do you feel um, you learned something or something, what did not change your practice? Was that significant or was it something we say, this is something we did in between, but we will reconnect to our earlier work. What is the... Well, no, definitely it has changed us tremendously. I mean, first of all, we started to work together from this... How do you know each other? Uh, well, we 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 knew each other as neighbors and as colleagues, but you know, not very well. So we now a curatorial duo and, and do biennial. <laughs> That's the first thing. But more on the systematic meta level is that, um, you know, you also see, for example, in that this, this project is, was based so much on an econ economy of gift. In the first edition, it was completely zero budget. It was really to send a signal, to give a gift of sorts to others or to, if, if you will. You had no budget, nobody got paid, no, not one euro Nothing. exchange Nothing. It was a complete no. free and open artwork. 
the first the first emergency first edition. yeah the first emergency edition and nobody asked a single question and of course we are all very sensitive about being paid right yeah but there was something just inappropriate i think because nobody really asked it was not needed the money was not in the horizon and that was very liberating also that there were some other needs to do this than just having a fee right and in the second edition we got a grant from berlin but we tried to keep somehow and i think we managed to keep still this this idea of a gift the idea of sharing um, of certain generosity and also as curators, you know, we were much less policing towards the artist. We were much less controlling. It was still mm -hmm. based on, because how can you really oversee if this is something which is really coming from your domestic sphere, from your living room, you know? It's like when I'm coming to your place, of course, I'm, I'm, I feel I'm a guest. So we were curators, but we were also guests in those people's lives. Therefore, we cannot be so, in our capacity of a dramaturg mm -hmm. curator overseeing. And this actually created much better symbiosis and much healthier relationship with all these artists. We were even thinking like how it's possible that, you know, we didn't do so much for the production because it's again bottom up. And still, most of the artists were writing uh, very grateful messages, even if they did all the work, you know? So yeah. what, 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 what happened? And mm -hmm. probably what one of the answers is this: Yes, how can art be more in the this this uh, in the sphere of the necessity, in the sphere of being a gift, uh, of being a, a sign of our interdependency? So we managed somehow to to touch the project, managed to touch on those issues. So you know, this definitely is something we carry mm -hmm. on with us. Yeah, how how interesting and important to actually. I was not so clear to me to think. Yes, you actually are not in the gallery, in a museum, uh, in a performance space, you are at the home and the artist is the host. And um, that bizarre uh, constellation, normally you watch television and someone comes on your screen and says, welcome, you know, but it's your home. And, uh, and here it's uh, something very different, but it's also the artist says welcome, but it's really his or her home. And um, it's a radical um, 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 transformation of, practices where normally people start out like the living theater started out in the living room so many mm -hmm. uh, performance artists started out uh, uh, in their in their own spaces and actually these were the great often they said these were the great great times or it ended in in small spaces like the uh, squad theater in hungary when they were forced to leave um, you know but they were couldn't perform anything anymore outside so they went to their own apartments and um, and then it was filmed supposedly by a friend and then it was on the secret service and they had to leave overnight uh, that the country so there is something uh, uh closeness and in terms of let her, tell me both a little bit of this idea of that socially engaged art the one claire bishop writes about tanya bruguera works about something that uh, also Florian Malsacker and uh, uh, others, you know, um, who John knows so well, they are, they are partners who you work together to the idea that um, something needs to change, has to change. What is your curatorial practice? What has it been all along and where are you going to? Where, where does that fit in? Well, I mean, maybe uh, with a big question, so we can devise yeah. a whole new seminar, you know, on the question that yeah. you're asking. <laughs> yeah, you could. Because, because uh, we... Go I mean, back to the faces, uh, maybe, Joanna. So, um... <laughs> I mean, uh, just like also to add to what Joanna said, I think this was the sense of, sense of trust. Uh, that you know we we managed to to build you know in our in our artistic networks but also in our conversation also uh, with each other that really like enabled uh, such a project of generosity like to happen because in order to be able to you know give to outside first we need to give to each other so that becomes also clear this act of generosity so this I think was was very uh, was very. Uh, clear uh, in in both of the uh, in both of the projects and then of course it also uh, i guess very much like um, heightened our desire uh, to uh, to try new models uh, to experiment further and not to lock ourselves you know within that kind of particular defined formats in the way we are expressing and in the way we are activating expressing our work 
uh, our thoughts or in the way that we are like facilitating or activating different connections between different spheres, different artistic spheres, and sometimes also even like uh, activist uh, spheres. But and I would say, I mean, I know, of course, like there is there's a really like a very particular strong like theories and socially like engaged practice. But from my side, I think there is a kind of a huge change, you know, after uh, after Tahrir Square uh, in the way, you know, people start to communicate with each other, the public space and intervene in that kind of collective memory of oppression. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, they change something, I think. And Tahrir Square is place. Istanbul, re- you refer to. And right? also Gezi Park. Mm-hmm. So I would love Gezi to also Park, connect yeah. to Gezi Park because also these days as we are commemorating the eighth year of Gezi Park, which is something so important for our generation in Turkey. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this was really like a kind of an intervention or a kind of a refuse to kind of live with that oppressive memory of the public space and try to create something within. And then I think this becoming a kind of a whole living practice so easily. Also, I think made us uh, like then uh, then question or like kind of ask about like the current definitions of uh, socially engaged art and then also another maybe question like on this line uh, would be what is not really socially engaged anymore because we are actually like in the period right now where artists would like to be more enablers you know and doers more and more even that we see this tendency, you know, in contemporary uh, art. So it's, it is, yes, it is still like a kind of an outcome of a, you know, of a video or like as an installation, but the process of enabling the whole communication that goes on to realize that piece, to touch something, a kind of a critical point in history or in a, or a community's memory is really like about enabling and doing something. And then we also see how artists then become speculative uh, thinkers, they become like historians, they become, uh, they become uh, fiction writers. So they really take on these different roles in order to, to enable. So I, I really do think, you know, these, these experiences also really shift uh, our understanding and practice uh, of uh, social engagement uh, in, in arts today. Uh, which uh, clearly also shaped uh, and being reshaped uh, by uh, what we experienced in the Balcone and what is also being reflected mm-hmm. in uh, other projects that we yeah. are realizing together with Joanna. But Joanna, maybe Joanna, you in your yeah, Joanna, in your in your field of vision, in your work, where does that fit in? And um, and uh, where do you see where is it going? And, and was it always part of your work to do such a project? And it just happened at this moment. Well, you know, we, st- we spoke about the stadium piece. Uh, it was also in that logic, right? Art being outside of the white cube, art being actually in relationship with the society. For me personally, art always feels too lonely in the museum. When I go to the museum and I see art object, it feels too abstracted. It feels too lonely. I've always been interested in working with art in context. And the Balcone is one of these very strong contexts for art, you know, where art really shows itself as a necessary part of the larger society. When it shows itself as almost like a snowball effect because it opens visions, it opens ideas. This year, to give an example, we had a fantastic, um, we had a contribution of um, a Turkish Kurdish artist, Pinar Ogrenci, and she just looked at the name of her street, uh, which is a name of a landlord from 15th century. But then she looked at in the history, there were like a, just few years when this street was named after a woman, after a social activist. And she brought back an image of this woman. And with this, she brought back all these questions why are streets called how they are? Who are they called after? How many streets are called after women and how many after men? And you know, this opens like a huge questions about public sphere and the fact that, for example, in Berlin, I would be curious to know how it is in New York, out of the streets named after human beings, um, only 10% are named after women. 
And mm -hmm. why is it so? I mean, of course, on one hand, we know why is it so, but what can we do uh, about it? And actually, all these questions were opened by an artist. So this is what I mean by, you know, art sitting and being interdependent. Because I'm placing it in our links, by the way, just for you also to view independently. Binar, yeah. So uh, for me, it's also interesting to go generally beyond the culture of mere display, because it's not only about display, it's about having an effect in the world. It's about actually one of the meanings of performativity, as John Mackenzie was defining it, right? And of course, from, from Austin on. Uh, having an effect. So finding a form which can be uh, subversive and effective at the same time. So this, this kind of public art, which is not drop down plot, plop art and the bad image of the public art that it has grown with the public art for many, many years, you know, being out of a context, this is really in the context, it's the, it's the opposite. And I think it, uh, it gives a lot of hope in how can art uh, function in the society. Yeah. Mm. Since we talk here normally a bit more about theater, performance, or dance, how what do you guys think about theater? What works, what does not work for you, or performance? Do you even watch it? Uh, what is your relation, like you two art curators? Um, what do you think about theater? You know, uh, maybe you remember when we met 2009, then I was still a theater curator. Um, yeah. And then somehow I, because I, I did theater studies and then I mig migrated. <laughs> To, to the neighbors, which is visual arts more. Um, also because I found more discourse uh, and more like, you know, more, yeah, open-mindedness. Maybe it's in the Eastern European context in visual arts. So I very much believe still in theater and the performative act, but, um, uh, but uh, there is some burden to it, which uh, visual arts didn't have. That's why somehow I migrated there. But I do believe in performativity very much. Mm -hmm. I mean, from uh, from my side, I would say like I maybe like a kind of a have a reverse relationship in terms of my especially teaching, because uh, what I am doing in the graduate school is uh, is really transdisciplinary artistic research, which means that. Uh, we are really having different, you know, lines of uh, lines of art. Uh, different researchers who are engaged with music, uh, with stage, with you know, with the discourse of stage uh, and with film, uh, alongside you know, visual arts uh, or like kind of uh, installation arts. And uh, and in this period also, I get to connect with I would say more choreographers also on my side. Uh, who are working on stage and who are like finding, trying to find ways like to decolonize their practice and then engaged in this kind of, in this also more discursive research, inviting me as the mentors in their process. For me, like kind of coming back from like visual arts and I'm, I'm uh, I mean, I'm coming mainly from the field of language and cinema. Uh, I studied translation studies and I started as a film writer and, um, and then moved on. Uh, to uh, visual arts. I find like this conversation for me uh, very, uh, very interesting uh, on that kind of the discourse of performance and how it can be shifted and how that shift can be translated to the act on stage, to the body on stage uh, and what it means also for a visual arts person like me to be part of that process. I find it very liberating this is something very new in my life uh, as of this year mm. no it is uh, it is uh, it is a quite stunning project what you both created congratulations really uh, on pulling it off first of all but also really it connects to so many things your past uh, work your present work also a future work i think it contributes and also highlighted the change the field um, is taking bernie fortman who we also had in our program here who wrote the um, offsides contemporary form performance beyond the site specific you know people said oh it's just oh let's see something interesting in that old factory uh, we see something in that old swimming pool that's not used and and uh, people will enjoy it more than going to the old-fashioned theater what you guys do of course the context the neighborhood the community the history of the place that the place already has a history that it performs its history through the artist, and that it helps us to create um, a meaning and also highlight, uh, you know, what uh, art really is all about, and that you do not need 
the machine, you know, so much of in perhaps, in perhaps a bit more in visual arts, I don't know enough, but also in theater, you know, it's about feeding the machine, which is so hungry, always something new, with the breathless run, especially in New York City, a city where they say they never sleeps, but always dreams and it doesn't rest, you know, and there's something we realize is not good about it. And, um, and you uh, found something that is, um, um, of importance as a symbol and uh, as a part of an imagination of a new of a of a new world. Did artists you work with did they mostly stay in Berlin? Did they leave? Uh, was this project part of? They feel more connected. Um, what were the? Um, how did they feel about it? They do live in Berlin and we receive actually in the first edition some questions from the journalists that they were not they thought that we were implementing artists in our mm -hmm. neighborhood but we said no we are, these artists are living in our neighborhood we are not no, I mean they didn't else. leave so many artists left New York City yes uh, I mean, for, for many us, reasons like, how different. was it in Berlin in pandemic they are time? here they are here they are more and more here like we still despite actually it's not what it used to be of course as we were mentioning about like the gentrification problem. So there is a big housing crisis also in Berlin in the horizon. That's uh, it's very much there because of the real estate prices and with the high demands uh, of the city. But there's still like artists also from various parts of the world, like they come to live still in, in Berlin. And, uh, in the, and despite the fact that uh, they are not able to always show in Berlin or they not really know about their existence in Berlin because institutions don't always invite them. Actually also our project also showed something, you know, that we matter, we take the matters also in our, in our own hands rather than, you know, waiting for that, for that moment to really also like mm -hmm. show that, you know, show that production and show that like kind of really important critical, uh, critical input uh, to our, to our city. And maybe like I would like to also add one thing that you said that you found something, but I wouldn't say it actually be found because it was there. We just listened to the call. And it's of you course, the way mm -hmm. we are listening to the call, of course, it's a nod to all of these artistic histories and legacies that, that actually worked in this field, clearly. But because of those things have been done, then we are able to respond it also in a different uh, way, I believe. Mm. Um, how are you following up on this as a curator duo, um, as a dynamic uh, Prenzlauer Berg duo that you, if I understand right, also that pandemic brought you together, uh, you realized you were neighbors and you realized you have a vision and you created something that, you know, um, uh, really um, um, produced something very meaningful to so many uh, who participated in it. Um, what is coming after this? Are you... Uh, going to collaborate, you have new projects, are you going to bring this, let's say, to Palermo or cities or Istanbul, <laughs> where the balconies, you know, are, um, there were are some of significance, you know, we once had a reading of a play in Rome, you know, this was all about the neighbors, you know, these kind of courtyard houses, you know, where there are the balconies and uh, you see and hear and um, Ivicini yeah. actually was the neighbor. So what are your projects? We are actually very, very busy because in one month from now or even less, opens a biennial that we do in Kosovo. It's called- Both Aut together, you're both together. Together, yeah. It's called Autostrada Biennial, taking place in three cities, in Pristina, Prizren, the very old city of Western Balkans, and Peja. And of course, it's not about the Balkona at all, but what we bring from this experience is that, uh, yeah, that art doesn't land there out of the sudden, you know, that, that art, is a part of a conversation with a local community. So mm -hmm. for example, we hope or their wishes or daydreams. We actually listened when we went there for, this, for the research trip, we just listened to so many interesting people. And based on what they were telling us, we kind of constructed the exhibition as a response to what they were saying. So the piece we open with is in collaboration with LGBTQI community and the pride parade in this region which is as you probably can feel it's not you know it's a very vulnerable structure still dangerous business yeah yeah it is yeah. dangerous business it's so the fifth edition. Mm -hmm. yeah it's the fifth yeah. edition yeah so so it's 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 based on this host and guest dynamic you know it's based on the diasporic and the local host and guest 
and art is a, a tool it's some kind of a glue some kind of skin that helps those two uh, sides meet mm. so it, from the balconies to the balcons you went uh, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, Oops, over, yeah, one can say that. Good one, yeah, good one. Over, uh, but what are you? What are you? What What else? What else is on? I know you guys are planning uh, other things. What are you or you or Jonah on your own? What are you working on? What's on your mind? Share a little bit of your ideas. Well, I mean, this is actually like at the moment the project Jonah mentions is what is all on our minds. You know, yeah. like especially okay. the project in the the, uh, the the collaboration that we are realizing uh, with. Uh, with the uh, community in Kosovo in terms of their also legal civic campaign uh, for equal rights and visibility in the society uh, with, with the help of two amazing artists, uh, Petrit Halilai and Alvara Urbano, uh, that we will be able to make uh, an installation of their work in the National Library in order, mm -hmm. you know, in order to uh, uh, help the campaign and also give the project also another the project that they realize another agency uh, uh, as part of its journey mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to really also uh, to really also discuss this different model of uh, collaboration and integration and how actually a biennial as such can respond to an on-site question and uh, how it can also like uh, challenge its format and like also even makes itself also more vulnerable as opening it more like to this everyday struggle. And I think uh, I think our work in the in the balcony boat also opened us even more further uh, to like this kind of connection with the everyday struggle uh, and like how we can bridge, you know, as mm -hmm. curators, how we can facilitate. Uh, you know, art's response to that everyday struggle and part, and its part in it. Uh, uh, so uh, this is a really it's like an important, like a kind of a format change for us because we are clearly challenging the the biennial format as it, as it is with every gesture that we are realizing also uh, inside this project because we are also looking for something new, um, mm -hmm. uh, which then the uh, majestic uh, floral installation of Petrit and Alvaro also become a symbol, I think, for our, mm -hmm. uh, for our search, uh, search as well. Uh, and then we hope to um, uh, continue also in the autumn uh, with, uh, in Riga with the 12th edition of the Survival Kit uh, Festival, where we are then bringing another infrastructural question like there to, to question the nature of survival kit today, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and how again then art becomes means uh, and uh, carries agency in the questions around uh, survival and especially in the constructions of in the age and care constructions of our liberal society uh, yeah. today. Yeah, so, no, it is it is so important, and especially also to do work in Kosovo. We know a Jayton. Netsi Rai, who once, I think, ran the, uh, uh, the National Theatre of Kosovo that then was being threatened just to be destroyed. Such an important place for some real estate reasons, or perhaps they people uh, didn't like it. And how come he did a play and toured around, and he told us how complicated the LGBT uh, question still is and what they were facing um, when they performed uh, um, these, these things. But I think what you offer, uh, theatre and performance, is in a way, I think Bertolt Brecht once said, uh, a really good critique of the car was an airplane. You know, he said, you know, it's not just uh, uh, that you, you know, well, how, how do you make it faster? Well, what different color? Maybe you have four mirrors or whatever. He said, no, he said, let's fly or something. So I think also what you, what you put up there is something that, you know, uh, lifted like the Mars, uh, a, a little helicopter uh, that even if it made not high, it was done in a small way, but as they pointed out also the, very beginning of flying, where we're small. So there's something um, you connected to, and it's very meaningful uh, comment and critique and encouragement also for the performing arts communities to really think through that concept um, of what you represented uh, in, um, um, in your work. So basically, because nobody knows what will happen, you are not planning anything for next year, for example, the year after you're still open, you, it's a, every, all the cultural institutions, they are holding back with future plans. What's the situation? 
I think we are planning the balcon at the right. The balcon okay. For sure, yeah, this is what we are planning. So maybe we should think of a New York edition. We find something to do it <laughs> and how we can uh, can uh, find a, a place, you know, where traditionally artists did live, like in the, or once used to be the Lower East Side. Now it's Williamsburg, you know, and uh, and um, maybe we can get you over if we find some funders, you know, or... Um, so you are also for hire. People can approach you with projects. Uh, what is, how does... How do you work together or do you create your own? Can book us for their balconies, you mean? <laughs> no, in general. Or do you work on your own? You create your no, work we like respond, artists? Uh, we respond you, to invitations. We so. respond to invitations, indeed. So we really, and we really both, I mean, we, we, as you understand, like we uh, we both have like the, uh, want to really respond it in an infrastructural way, those invitations we, we receive and to really like take care of uh, uh, context with a with a different uh, with different question, and of course, it is about the collaborative engagement. It is about the feminist engagement. It is about uh, a different horizontal share of powers, and it's also giving power also different meaning in that in that moment of share. So, yeah. but we would like to really like also exercise it through the like situations or the projects that are let's say sent to our care in a certain way or our address to our care and how we can uh, find really like a sensible way of working with it each time new rather than repeating the same format over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now really stunning to, uh, to uh, female curators, you know, working in Berlin from this, the Polish and Turkish background, creating a project for that international neighborhood, but also the very German neighborhood, as you pointed out with the names in it, and that then went on to become a kind of a global uh, initiative. It's a, a stunning, I think. And um, for us, who we are also looking for new forms for the new times we live in, I think certainly this is something where one asks, why hasn't it happened before? It seems so simple, as you said, it's kind of instructional art and it was not so very expensive um, compared to what you think, what, a, what how much it costs to bring a company, to fly in a big company, you know, with 20, 30, 40 members and uh, how much impact does it really has on one neighborhood sometimes, you know, if it's just in the big houses. But I think they are not uh, this or that. I think we have to have additional engagements. And there are the great Berlin Festspiele and uh, who also did the great uh, um, uh, um, Down to Earth project, you know, what happened in the park with all electricity and uh, but just with sunlight. And, and, and then there's something new coming out of that city of Berlin that is important for all of us. So thank you. Um, really, um, for sharing um, anything uh, else, it's uh, on your mind. Maybe tell us a little bit what what helped you to get through that time. What did in, you guys read? Uh, what did you listen to? What inspired you? What should our listeners say? This is interesting. Follow that. Is there something, some tips you have for us? Hmm. <laughs> There's always this question: What's your favorite book? And then you're like. Ask you get it. No, what you're reading, not favorite. <laughs> what have you? That's what have you been reading? You know, so not favorite, but what you, what has been meaningful um, in the last. Well, I I've, I've read a classic. I mean, a classic of queer, uh, the, but it's U.S. American, so I guess everybody knows yeah. it because it comes from uh, the Argonauts. This is what mm -hmm. I have read recently: the queer life of a scholar from California. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't have to do. And from the professional side, I would re definitely recommend a, a, an anthology, which is online, about anti-racist curating. What does it mean to curate in an anti-racist way? Uh, it has been edited uh, by free editors. Nor Nora Sternfeld is one of them. Mm -hmm. So those are my list, my recent um, readings, both private and professional. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, from from my side, um, I would uh, say uh, Gloria Anzaldua, The Borderlands, a text I think very well known also in, in US, uh, the Chicana uh, uh, theoretician, artist uh, and writer, which also I had the chance to study with, with my uh, students, uh, which was really uh, powerful as an experience also altogether. And it was really also very good to revisit uh, Angela Davis's uh, race, class, gender uh, for intersectional thinking. 
Um, so these, I think, and then alongside, um, maybe I should also uh, like talk book that really also deeply uh, shaken me was uh, uh, Saidia uh, Hartman's Lose Your Mother that really deeply touched me in this period. Mm -hmm. And it also really inspired for how you can create a new language out of uh, out of a very particular, very deep trauma, how you manage to write a new history and a new relation on top of it, with it, uh, mm -hmm. and change the collective memory. So uh, I would say these are my Good. Three. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So I hope to see you all both in New York or in Berlin when I'm there. Really um, let us know what you are okay. doing. Anybody wants to do the balcony project project in New York City, call us. Um, it's as you said, it's a grassroots movement. It's open <laughs> and uh, all other stuff. Um, so really, really, thank you for taking the time uh, for talking to us and um, Frank, and, thank uh, you for wonderful moderation. Well, yeah, thank you for wonderful. I wish moderation. it would be wonderful. <laughs> This yeah. is really one of the one of the best moderations that we really had. It's really yeah. fun. Like, thank you for your That's questions. Good. Definitely. Good. I didn't know you had so many. I thought I just discovered you guys. And nobody. <laughs> had ever heard of you. And, uh, no, no, no. But that that is um, no. It is really. We heard about the project. I think there was also a short mentioning in the Times. I didn't didn't see Florian. Of course, that Frank. Think about that uh, also. And. Um, but I'm so glad we, we have you to uh, next week. Uh, we will have um, uh, Paulette Richards, uh, Manuel Moran, and the great Claudia Orenstein, uh, who writes so much about puppetry. She did the Rutledge Companion, and it's about socially engaged uh, way how puppetry can connect uh, to the times we are here. So they are thinking about new ways new, to um, perform uh, um, their puppets, their objects, and uh, in, in that new time. Um, we live in Friday. We have uh, a great uh, French, uh, African French uh, director, Penda Diouf, uh, playwright Penda Diouf and Marine uh, Bachelot Nugent, and they will talk about their work in France and what it means uh, uh, for them and the inner reality, in that also changing reality. And um, we're still working uh, with other uh, uh, the speakers. So Wednesday is not a hundred percent confirmed yet, but we will know uh, much more soon. So thank you all to our listeners for listening in. I think that was truly a very interesting and important update uh, from Europe. And, um, and the work uh, is of significance and importance. And we really have to think about it. And as I always say, think about also what does it say for our lives? Because we shouldn't just consume and the arts or see the entertainment. How can you and your apartment you know, share your work? Invite people, invite your neighbors, uh, uh, create uh, a, a little performances or do readings at home or do, hang something out of your window if you can and, uh, and reach out and think about the history, where you live, where the neighborhood comes from. Maybe check out the name of the streets uh, you live in. So um, this is all of significance for us because it stands for something much bigger, but it's also a call to get and engage. So thanks to HowlRound again for hosting us, the great Thea and VJ, Andy from the Siegel Center and everybody who supports us. So I uh, hope to see you again, a great uh, weekend and uh, both of you enjoy a, finally a nice sunny uh, 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 a weekend in Berlin. And I hope also in Portugal, it should be there nice anyway. So um, <laughs> thank you all. And, um, and uh, I hope you will write a little documentation about this work, photos, a little book production, you should do that and take it serious. So to have the balconies as a, uh, as a um, uh, documentation, that's, I think visual arts are so much better than uh, the theater people. We often, you know, do something in the moment and then it's gone. But I think uh, this especially is a project that uh, is someone for the history book. So thank you all and uh, goodbye. Stay tuned, stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Frank. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you again for your questions. Bye.